have some panelists uh, who have uh, tremendous experience. I'll let them introduce themselves, but tremendous experience in the gaming industry. And, uh, and I'm honored to uh, introduce them. So, Paul, why don't you start with you? Sure. I'm Paul Petroni. I'm the director of uh, Big Data Analytics at Lillian Systems, also a uh, uh, You know, I've been in the gaming industry since 2010. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but uh, that's really when you know things like the Duke were coming out and uh, Vertica 3.0 was just you know released, and uh, uh, you know it was it was a time where 
but we are glad that during this era where you know, there are in-memory distributed computing databases, uh, streaming applications are available that are making it possible as well. So uh, we would like to just hear some of the use cases where uh, players can have uh, real-time insights, or the company can have real-time insight while the player is playing the game, and they can uh, improve their experience. That, that, that kind of ingestion uh, right on the data pipeline, is that have any effect in terms of the overarching infrastructure, whether it's hardware layer or software layer? What do we have to do differently than, than we used to? Sure. I mean, uh, when you see the big data ecosystem, it's just not the uh, like analytics or just data ingestion. It's not from the infrastructure layer. When we are deploying the uh, ecosystem, we have to start from the infrastructure layer first. You know that's that's the uh, layer where machines are doing the hard work. Uh, you know customers can go to the uh, infrastructure layer, whether it's in their private data center or in the cloud. But uh, it starts uh, from the choosing the right hardware, and then we have to see you know what is the ingestion rate, how quickly we are going to ingest how much is the volume of the data so that we can configure the uh, infrastructure uh, layer accordingly. Uh, but that's like the bottom layer. After that, there is the database layer. Um, uh, for a particular database, we will be you know, suggesting recommending a particular set of hardware. And that database layer, it's, it's, um, I mean, we are in the era where uh, distributed computing frameworks are the way to go. There is a single node that is ingesting the data, and there is a high volume of data, or there is a high velocity of the data. There is a very high chance that uh, we are using a lot of CPU cycles, or we are seeing a lot of I/O when we are going to query the uh, database layer. So uh, it is important to write, strike a right configuration between the infrastructure layer and the database layer. That being said, once we have decided the database layer, we have to do proper data modeling. We have to make sure that the way we are ingesting the data, or we are doing a lot of transformations in the database itself, because databases. Uh, required for storing and querying the database, but if it's also doing a lot of ETL, uh, if it's doing taking the ETL workload as well, doing a lot of transformation, uh, then we, we cannot give like real time responses. Uh, and then there are a couple of more layers on top of it, but but it's a full ecosystem and uh, proper design needs to be uh, done. And this will be different for different use cases. Uh, some people, some some companies won't require like real time. They say, hey, if we get the recommendations. Uh, after 24 hours, that's good for us. So their infrastructure layer will, will be different. So uh, the whole ecosystem uh, is evolving. Uh, I'm uh, proud to say that SciStorex is working very hard in this uh, field, and we are launching a big data appliance uh, that is taking care of all these needs. We have seen, we have worked with multiple gaming clients, and we have seen that what are the requirements, and if we can provide a uh, appliance that can you know, fit it into customers' data center or like a managed service, uh, they can just leverage. If they don't have to get into the nitty-gritty details of uh, whether this NoSQL database or NewSQL database is required for it, uh, we can customize the appliance for them, and uh, it will be ready to go. So th those are the changes that are evolving. But it, it obviously depends upon the use case that we are taking. Yeah, and the other thing I like to add is, is that you know every gaming company has different challenges. Sure. Right? You know there there are there are gaming companies that put everything up into Amazon. Uh, and run their infrastructure within Amazon. There are those that put it in their own data center or have some kind of hybrid approach there. Um, and you know, there are different technology technologies that have advantages in the cloud versus on-prem. And there, there's you know, there's equivalence uh, equivalence of technologies that you can put in the cloud or, or on-prem. But you know, there, there's from a from a uh, from a data ingestion. There isn't just one solution, right? You know, there is no one size fits all, uh, and so I, we take a very pragmatic approach where let's figure out what is, you know, what are the specific challenges about that incoming data stream, and let's figure out what are those, what are the right sets of technology that can work together so that you can do things like add real time or near real time ingestion uh, based on on some kind of SLA that the company has built company. 
know, speaking from a, kind of a database standpoint, because uh, the, the shift from a road store database, yeah. something like SQL Server or MySQL or you know, a, a charted cluster of, of MySQL, yeah. uh, and then going from that to a columnar design like Vertica or you know, tools like Redshift, Regions, uh, columnar-like databases, the, that was a big shift in how we started to look at this. Uh, wasn't, it wasn't so much around uh, how we changed the way we wrote data, but it's how we thought about writing data. You know, when, when you look at a, 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 a row store database, something like SQL Server, uh, there are certain decisions you make about what is the right uh, kind of schema design, yeah. vertical or form, what have you. When you talk about a columnar database, you want it to be more And, and the benefits you get by uh, the change in that underlying architecture yeah. of the database. I mean, the database is still a database. It's yeah. still SQL. Sure. Uh, but, but how you structure that data within that database you know, takes you from you know, 48 hours to answer a query to seconds. Yeah. Uh, and I think you know, that, was, that was a big shift. Yeah. Hansi, do you want to talk about sure. uh, in memory? Uh, in memory, as well as on the infrastructure side, Big shift on the infrastructure level. So at that point, I'm 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 not worried about the uh, uh, SATA drives, SAS drives, or the flash drives. Uh, I'm 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 dealing with blocks. I'm dealing with sure. uh, a file system that can not that is not just um, available in one data center. It, it is you know uh, uh, it, that can be extended to multiple data centers over the globe. So we are talking about um, uh, when we talk about petabytes of data, still people are storing in one data center. But uh, moving forward, when we have already an uh, realize that uh, analytics can do powerful things for an organization, we will be accumulating lot and lot of data, and not just one data center will be enough. We will sure. be cross-replicating. We will have uh, pieces of data in one data center, pieces of data in another data center. So that's the shift we are seeing uh, from our infrastructure layer. And uh, to touch base one uh, point that Paul mentioned, in-memory. In-memory is definitely uh, uh, gaining a lot of at attention uh, because everyone wants to um, gain the insights in seconds, milliseconds, you know. Yeah. Uh, there are libraries available if uh, I, I knew there are a lot of technical folks here. Um, uh, you might be aware of uh, message passing interface libraries uh, that people use and you can go up to, uh, like in one millisecond you can get real-time responses. Uh, Vertica use spread, uh, that's another library for uh, uh, distributed computing. So every node has to talk to each other, right? So these are the libraries that are available. But if you want real-time analysis, uh, the in-memory distributed computing is the way to go. There are a lot of technologies, and uh, we can touch base on that if required. Um, um, Hadoop has its own components that support in-memory distributed computing. There are other databases that are out of the um, uh, Hadoop ecosystem, but they support in-memory uh, computing. Uh, but so far, Anything that res resides in memory, uh, and if it can persist on disk, uh, is the uh, way to go. I want to shift a little bit, uh, and I li love those answers, uh, shift a little bit uh, in terms of a data economy. And by that I mean there's supply and there's demand. And so, you know, there's um, data source, data publishers basically, and data consumers. And I want to get your perspective, and I'll start with Alex, on. What do you see as uh, the new evolution of this new relationship? How is the engagement from the people that are consuming the data versus what the source is? Sure. I mean, first of all, just from an internal organization standpoint, we're seeing that 
we're able to present this data in dashboards to a variety in, of the of people within the organization that normally wouldn't have been exposed to this data because they can make much more sense of it. Um, we're also seeing a huge shift in companies wanting to give that data to the customer and to the gamer themselves. Um, if you look at like League of Legends, you can see some fantastic, beautiful uh, graphs that they've created of matchups that, uh, you know, that not only the, co the company doesn't have to build it, but the actual gamers and the consumers and the community can generate and continue to improve upon the game. Interesting. And, and does that inspire kind of new use cases when things uh, come up. I know uh, in terms of uh, uh, the Giants, the, the baseball team, their CIO talked about big data and presenting stats on their players on the field and knowing how quickly they were close to the ball when the ball was uh, caught, if you're in the outfield, or how far off on the base the, the, the runner was going. And so that new level of stats almost introduces new use cases. And I'm wondering what kind of things emerge when you start presenting all that data? Sure, I mean specifically in like the free to play realm, we're seeing a lot of uh, concepts being able to be implemented from, that, that normally wouldn't have been implemented in the game. Um, and be able to, the companies seem to be able to shift their decision making and how they're uh, building the, the game and how they're monetizing on the game um, on the fly uh, and able to take, you know, strategies from one game and, and move it to another. Um, so I was seeing that as a big uh, uh, change that's really helping the free-to-play markets because it's able to monetize on these players that normally the game would, you know, would have gone under. Interesting. Paul, you got? Yeah, I, you know, I, when, I, when I think about data, I think about it as there's the data that you as the organization, you as the company, the game maker, uh, are producing, your yeah. internal data. Yeah. But now there's this, you know, talk about social media and, and the influence that social media has on your title. Uh, and it's not just, not just you know, tweets or, or comments being made about your title, it's about your competitor. Uh, and so, you know, that's where I see a lot of kind of uh, evolution is, is taking that external data and understanding, you know, who are you up against? Who is your competition? Um, and, and, you know, is it, does my competition have better sentiment than I? And, and what is it about that, that particular title? Can I do some additional research to figure out what is it about that particular title, my, my direct competitor, uh, that makes them stand out a little better, for better or worse? Mm. Uh, and how do I either avoid that or maybe try to emulate or try to do better then? Interesting. Any other thoughts before we move on? Um, so actually, I think Paul and Alex already covered it, but uh, in terms of real-time dashboards, I think uh, one thing is, uh, to continue with the layers I was saying, this is also the part of it. Uh, we started with the infrastructure layer, then data database layer, data modeling layer, then there is machine learning algorithms layer where we train the data sets. And um, so we have the training data set and then we have the data sets that is incoming. So we aggregate the data and make sure that we have the data set in the uh, most usable format so that we are not running like very complicated queries and that that will take a lot of time. So we already do a lot of computations. So when a uh, real-time dashboard uh, or analytics, uh, when what people want to see, uh, they are querying against the database, they can get very fast uh, results. Most of the time, uh, even in dashboards, we are seeing that either it's a metric analytics that it, it is stagnant, you know, it, it is showing what happened even like last five minutes, even if you have you were talking about last five minutes, it is like metric an analytics because you're not, in, not talking about what, what's going to happen in the future. So uh, visualization layer is a very important piece, and, but, but for the real-time dashboard uh, analytics, uh, um, again, we have to have a proper stack so that we can give a useful information. If you can uh, predict the future that like, this player is going to churn in the next seven days, or uh, you need to focus on these kind of players uh, or who are the social whales in your uh, or in, in your uh, game, uh, yeah. and you have uh, different tabs within the dashboard where exactly you can see that, hey, the executive team can see different kind of analytics, operational team wants different kind of analytics, but uh, all of them are seeing through a same dashboard. That, that's the uh, beauty of analytics, and that's where uh, uh, the visualization layer excels. Yeah, and before we go on, you can also be able to predict how the user is going to act and exactly what Anka was saying, and you can really push certain items or certain levels 
or a certain hence to a user based on feedback from the data that you're getting in the game. So say someone's getting stuck on a certain level um, or say the their first uh, purchase is a, uh, something that's more of a collective item that you know doesn't provide a whole lot of value um, in terms of like stats boosting, um, but more of an, an aesthetic kind of value. Uh, we can treat that player differently than you would uh, someone who's more calculated and a hardcore gamer that wants to you know ensure that they have the best boosted stats. So it's really looking at the game design differently because of that too. Interesting. Okay, well, I want to uh, maybe branch off a little bit on this notion and kind of begin with the sentiment analysis piece that, Paul, you brought to, to our attention. Um, it seems like that there are new inflows to the data river, if we want to call it that. And there are oftentimes, as you described, Alex, new outflows to different groups. So how does that have an impact on the data pipeline architecture? What are we looking at in terms of either the physical or logical flow of that data pipeline. And then, repeat the question. So there's new inflows, new influx of data sources, right. and oftentimes even outsource or redirecting of maybe partial components so that different parts of the organization see some semblance of it. Right. And the question really is at an architectural level, how does that shift from what we were doing before? What, how does the architecture look now in order to accommodate new exogenous or ex extra data from a sentiment analysis? How does that look at an architecture level? I mean, Akan, you, you can start with that. Sure. Uh, basically, you all uh, must be aware of the data lake concept. And uh, basically, we need a landing zone where we can ingest the data. Um, there are multiple ways how uh, we are seeing a shift. Basically, earlier people used to just um, have a landing zone where we will, they will just have all the raw data sitting and then there will be a transformation layer and then they will be presenting the data. Uh, but they were using multiple big data technologies for uh, that. And um, um, right now, if you see, I will just pinpoint to Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, if you see in the Hadoop ecosystem, if you want to um, ingest all the data, whether it is semi-structured, structured, unstructured. Uh, for example, in unstructured, if you just want to analyze the data, like PDF files, you can just ingest the PDF files and run a word count problem on the PDF file, or you can say that, hey, what is the, uh, there is an image in the uh, PDF file and there is a, a context summary around that image. And um, uh, if we have a mechanism where we read the uh, summary, we figured out the connotation and we match with the image that, hey, it matches and this is a positive connotation because machine doesn't know if it doesn't do the image processing, it just does the uh, word count analysis or it just figured out the sentiment analysis and that's used to be done like a couple of years ago. Uh, right now there is a one next step where people are running image processing algorithm and seeing what, what image it is and is it corresponding to the summary that has been written or the text that is wrapped around uh, the image. So, but for doing that kind of complicated processing, you need uh, 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 technologies that can support all, all of these things. So, um, for example, like uh, Hadoop, uh, when you, you can customize, you can uh, import some of the libraries that can read the PDF data, they can read the image data, and you can do all the analysis within the one data lake. Uh, but earlier, we saw a trend that uh, people were using multiple uh, big data technologies. For example, they will have an OLTP database. It will be a, they will be ingesting the data in it, and uh, they can even ingest high-velocity data in it. But then there is a data warehouse, and then there is an archival uh, solution. So there, is a, there are tiers. Uh, sure. But uh, what we are seeing is people don't want to manage different data silos. They don't want database administrator for each database technology. They don't want system uh, administrator or ops team to be overwhelmed with, oh, now we have another new big data, big data technology. Uh, so uh, with the advent of technologies that, that can create a big data lake, they can seamlessly form an ecosystem. Uh, th that's the shift we are uh, seeing. And also with the, the cost of storing that data becoming so, uh, le so much less expensive than it was previously, we're seeing a lot of customers wanting to ingest as much as possible and store as much as possible because of the future insights they might be able to gain from it, even if they're not sure how you know, upfront they're going to gain from it. So say like uh, level design and footprint patterns of where they're going, the player's going within the game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they may not know, the designer may not know upfront how that 
uh, that data could eventually affect the level design, but now that the storage of that data and the ability to, like much like Paul was saying, the sensor data um, is able to just come in and we're able to store it, then we're able to gain insights that we wouldn't have known possible uh, at the, the beginning of the, of the game or the launch of the game. Interesting. You said footpath. Sure. Interesting. I'm taking that one home. I love that. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, if you look at these different technologies, uh, you know, it used to be that the, 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 there was definite walls uh, between the different technologies. You know, databases only handled structured data. Something like Hadoop could do structured data and semi-structured data and unstructured data. Uh, something like an object store, can, whatever you want to throw at it, you can throw at it. Uh, but, you know, we're starting to see kind of, if you look at the, the data warehouse and Hadoop, it's, it's starting to, that wall is starting to melt a little bit. Uh, you know, you're seeing uh, data warehouses have the ability to do schemaless data ingestion. Yeah. So I don't need to define a table anymore. I can bring in JSON data or, right. or XML data right. and analyze it in place, figure out what's there, and then decide if I want to put it into a, a structured format or not. Yeah. Any favorite technologies that you guys are seeing that come in on the horizon? Things that people would like to have under the Christmas tree. I mean, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, we have uh, it's it's very use case specific, sure. uh, and uh, we are technology agnostic company, and we respect the uh, requirements of the client. Uh, we have seen a uh, lot of use cases around WoolDB database. Uh, people who want to make real-time decision making in gaming industry, uh, they tend to go towards the WoolDB database. Uh, people who want to do deep uh, dive analytics, they tend to go for uh, uh, Vertica database just because it supports a lot of analytical functions, windowing functions, all these analytical functions just come out of the box. They have uh, distributed R support, so a lot of statisticians feel very comfortable with R, but the problem is that uh, they always get the data from the database to their local machine and then analyze and then put it back so wherever there is data movement that that's a big problem so uh, if you have the um, data sitting in your database and you can write uh, in your uh, programming language favorite programming language like R or you can write UDF functions in Java or C++ you can uh, write functions equal to the uh, uh, so for example let's say uh, if we talk about Vertica Vertica uh, and if you write your user defined function in uh, C++ you can sit in the same process in which Vertica is running so you get the utmost performance uh, mm. the only problem is that uh, if your process is not fenced and if you if you haven't uh, done your job, uh, you know, good, you might bring the whole database down. So generally we use the fenced uh, programming technique. Uh, but um, uh, that being said, uh, we, we have seen these kind of trends and again, Hadoop has been the de facto standard. Uh, most of the organizations uh, deploy a Hadoop ecosystem for various reasons. One, uh, to create a, a unified data lake, uh, another, another, uh, another organization uh, deploy a Hadoop cluster because they don't want to spend a lot of money on their licensing. They want to save the licensing uh, cost, so the, uh, they end up storing uh, the hot data, maybe one month data or three months data in the, uh, let's say, Vertica or another any other uh, massively parallel architecture database, and then they store rest of the data on the Hadoop. And um, uh, as a solutions integrator, it's our responsibility to make sure that uh, we create a seamless integration between all these uh, technologies. So uh, we call it like uh, uh, VVH triangle architecture where uh, the WoLDB can sit uh, customer f doing customer facing analytics like making real time decision making. Uh, the example that I was giving, a player is playing and depends on, depending upon his mood, let's say if he's happy and he's making a purchase of let's say, um, in normal conditions $13, um, but um, because we have already uh, accumulated this data over the period of time and our machine learning algorithms that predict that uh, he is in happy mood at this moment of time. And if we uh, propose a virtual sword that he's more likely to uh, uh, buy and he has the spending capacity, at the real time we can propose that, hey, buy this blue sword and you can compete, your, compete with your uh, opponent and you will be you know, 10 level up uh, against your competitor. So he's more likely to buy that sword at that moment of time. And uh, um, by using this kind of architecture, instead of $13, we, we end up uh, we end up helping the customer buying $23. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a win-win situation because he's happy that he uh, sure. won the game. We are happy because we help our clients in making that transaction. Um, that being said, um, uh, so 
but but for deep dive analytics, there there is definitely um, uh, you need a lot of analytical function support, and uh, uh, these are the three major technologies that we are seeing. But uh, uh, object storage has gained a lot of traction. We sure. have clients always requ requesting about um, softwares like Scality, Cleversafe, and all these things. Like, what needs to be done? Uh, do we sh should we worry about replacing the um, uh, Hadoop distributed file system? And what are the advantages? Uh, how we can create an environment like Amazon S3? Because when we are creating a sync repository on our local machines, uh, then we see a lot of bandwidth usage, and that rises their uh, you know uh, bandwidth bill, network bill. So. Uh, that kind of technologies are very common, like on a daily basis we will get uh, a few requests that are uh, surrounding those technologies. All right. And I want to touch on some of the, the social listening software and the, the change, the shift from the console games to the, the PC or the mobile games where you're able to actually see what keywords acquired your user. Say, you know, you're promoting uh, an ad for your game and you're promoting on certain keywords. You're able to now see and estimate how well that player will do or how well they're monetized or how well they'll, you know, retain um, based on what keywords they were brought in from. Um, so it can get you know, as complex as you really want it to be in terms of what people are searching for and what, you know, you are looking to, uh, to cater to. Um, but some of these social listening software tools are fantastic, like Crimson Hexagon, Sysimos, um, Cision, uh, Sprinkler, and they're, you know, really they're helping companies build communities and to drive players in at once because we're seeing so many of these social games that can only exist if there is a large influx of players at once. Um, if, you know, say words with friends or say uh, the trivia crack, you know, if you don't have another player to play with right away, then you're not going to be very likely to, to play. So, you know, we're seeing that big shift as well. Interesting. I think in my house, uh, all games run on curse words because I keep hearing them. I, you know, I thought maybe we would take a quick pause and uh, let this highly intelligent audience maybe ask about some technologies or other things that they're seeing that we haven't talked about. Any thoughts or, um, or should I say what technology questions or things you've heard about or you believe is relevant and interesting? Uh, it sounds like you all have had a lot of experience with integrations in the big data realm. Um, I want to kind of shift my, uh, the focus of the conversation more towards maybe like an e-commerce realm where maybe you've had some experience tagging um, an e-commerce site for a game company, not necessarily related to in-game analytics, but e-commerce metrics related to a game company. Um, from our experience, you know, from my experience, I know that tags, vendor tags, can be very um, hard to maintain without this new concept called tag management system, and um, it's essentially a centralized repository where you can go and and dynamically tell which tags need to fire on what pages. Have you had a lot of experience with, uh, in your integrations with dealing with tag management system technologies and do you feel like there's any sort of innovation that can be made there in that uh, space? Most of, at least my um, my experience is towards data engineering, data plumbing uh, side, and integration of multiple technologies. On the application uh, side, uh, I haven't touched on that uh, tagging. Is, is there any, uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, uh, some of the work you, you did in life sciences, is there any any kind of parallelism there with, with tagging? You know, looking at different kinds of, uh, you know, genomic data, for instance. Is, is, is there any parallels there, or is it... So in the data ma database management system, I can just give you an example that might be the close closest one. Basically, what we were doing was um, there is genome sequences that come from uh, different hospitals. We have patients. We get the data from uh, uh, genomic data for these patients. It can be genomic sequences. It can be exome sequences. And uh, we used to tag these sequences, like whether it is genome sequences, whether it is exome, which, which hospital it came from, uh, which department it came from, uh, which patient. And it is non-identifiable or non-identifiable uh, uh, information. So we have to tag all these things. But uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, exactly what you guys are doing. Uh, but we wrote a, like a custom software for that. It was like a, a long two and a half years project where we wrote a custom uh, software. When we uh, get the sample from outside hospital uh, till uh, we can tell like a, a person in uh, 
uh, in a population like American, uh, white American population or African American population, we do genome analysis on that, cohort analysis on top of that. So we know, need those tags because at the end of the day, we need to tell their family, let's say, uh, if there is some serious threat, threat to uh, your kid because we are generally collecting kid samples. So for example, there is an autism disease. We need to tell them that, you know, hey, with how much probability we can, uh, t we can say that this disease will uh, go into your uh, kids. So th that way tagging was very helpful and we wrote a custom software that was uh, tagging the individual and we can tell even at the end of the uh, cohort analysis also. Uh, what are the chances of uh, uh, occurrence of that kind of mutation in this individual as compared to uh, all the other individuals in a population? So, uh, but I'm not sure if there are standard tools available out in the market that you can just leverage and get things done. Um, so that's my thoughts about it. And one thing to add, I, I have seen marketing creative uh, change based on the tagging that we're seeing of, of the users coming through. So, you know, if we initially had thought, oh, it's, it's going to be a uh, male dominant, you know, 30 to, or, you know, 18 to 30 age range, and it ended up being more female dominant, um, then, you know, we would change the creative accordingly. So I've seen uh, definitely that feedback uh, loop happening um, based on the tags. Precisely. More like, uh, remarketing, rebranding based on what you're seeing, sure. Um, and then, you know, new ad buys based on, and on certain site takeovers, say, now that you know that you have a certain demographic that's doing better. All right, any other, sir? Uh, not sure if this was touched on, but um, for casual games, social games in particular, uh, graph processing systems are very interesting, things like giraffe, uh, Gephi for visualization. Do you have uh, any thoughts on where that stuff's going? Um, I can tell you from my experience, uh, we have developed a um, uh, distributed processing system using Neo4j, uh, that's uh, Java based, and uh, Titan, uh, that's another graph database system. Uh, we encountered a uh, lot of issues where the scalability is a problem. So in graph database for the audience who are not familiar, we store the data uh, in forms of nodes and edges and basically we get, get the data. It, it, irrespective of uh, the, how we collect the data, we transform into the form of triplets and then nodes and edges and when, then we figure it out how we are going to write graph traversal algorithms so that we can solve some of the problems. Most of the uh, clients uh, switch to graph database when they figure it out that they are writing a query which has like a subquery, then there are another subquery. Uh, such kind of problems can be transformed to graph, uh, graph algorithms very quickly. So uh, depending upon what kind of graph algorithm it is and do you you want to jump from one node to another, if you are doing that, if your node is stored in, on some other node, uh, there is a network call, you, you get a hit. So um, again, uh, uh, it might be too early to spit it out, but uh, we end up, we took all the concepts from Neo4j and Titan Graph Database. They have their own uh, query language, like in Neo4j Cypher query language. In uh, case of uh, uh, Titan Graph Database, we use Gremlin uh, and um, uh, uh, but we end up writing our own internal in-memory graph database uh, that we can use. And uh, that's what I was saying, that uh, we end up using Intel MPI library uh, for that. Uh, we uh, used multiple open source libraries, like OpenMPI 1.7.2 version, Intel MPI library. Uh, but that was the solution if you want like in-memory fast processing graph travel, if you want to implement graph uh, traversal algorithms, uh, uh, Simple queries like friends of friends or doing some kind of social media analytics, you can do and you can get the answer in like 11 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds. That's, uh, but if you write a complex graph algorithm, uh, it takes very long. And it, the data, if the data sits in the memory, then it's uh, great. So Hadoop has taken a step in that uh, direction. If you are familiar with Spark, Spark is the uh, uh, distributed computing engine and it's a core engine and on top of that uh, there are components that are available like Spark Streaming and the, uh, as you were saying, the Giraffe X. Uh, so, uh, but still the algorithms are very basic algorithms. Uh, uh, I have seen much better performance uh, for the data uh, by just using the uh, distributed R, as I was mentioning earlier. If I just write a page rank algorithm, and uh, if I turn on the co-location, I get very high uh, performance. Um, 
That being said, uh, I think uh, still the graph database from the Spark perspective is in initial stages. There will be, there will be uh, developers who will be contributing and writing the algorithm, and we can import those libraries and start using them. So those, but it's still in the initial stages. Are you working on some uh, problem right now that needs um, Right. Uh, a lot of the sort of questions that you ask in the graph database might be more suited right. to use. So we've done some specific stuff right. that would be interesting to talk about if, if there are there more generic right. solutions which that sort of pipeline place would be appropriate. Sure, but you are reading from the disk when you are doing graph traversals? Uh, we, we, we have done some of that stuff, yeah. What's that? Yeah, we've, we've done some of that stuff. So we've no, but you read from the disk, the data is uh, stored on the disk? So get away with using stuff like uh, well, graph labs, I suppose, we're using. Sure. We just about right. process all of our data one day on that. OK. I don't know uh, much of the details of your use case, but some of the keywords that you can take away is, one, the distributed computing is the way to go. Uh, if you can solve your problem and if you can store the data on multiple machines instead of one machine, that's one way to go. And second is, uh, whatever is your hot data that you want to process uh, algorithm on, if it's sitting in memory, that's the another way to go. If you're reading the data from the disk, that takes most of the time. Uh, so uh, that's the problem with most of the graph database right out in the market. If you want to just use, it will solve your problem. But uh, uh, you might not be able to gain a lot of performance or uh, fault tolerance or security, single sign on, all these things that are like our enterprise grade solution. So um, uh, it will be good to chat about you know, your use case and maybe we can pitch in uh, some more comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Have you worked with any game clients on actually taking the results of your big data analysis and then visualizing it back in the game engine? So you mentioned like foot tracking, and that's something that's really hard to visualize with Tableau, say in 2D, and really works better in 3D. So have you tried that, and what does that actual data pipeline look like if you want to close the loop with that? Interesting. So where the, the feedback to the, cu to the customer itself? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess I would say the best example there would be uh, uh, the change of game design for the Might and Magic Duel Champions uh, card game, which is a Hearthstone competitor, um, and being able to basically give uh, feedback to the user of how well they're doing versus a certain uh, other heroes, like others, you know, uh, if they're specifically weak in one area, um, then giving them that information that, hey, you need to work on you know, the ability to uh, defeat this type of uh, a rush uh, attack or uh, you know, say you're too much of a, a, a booming kind of a you know, type of player. Um, so that type of feedback does, has definitely helped players um, to evolve their game and to get better. Any, any specific visualization techniques? Um, not particularly in game. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Seems like a real opportunity, though. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Other thoughts? I wanted. I want to kind of introduce another, um, what I call the ultimate Pac-Man of our industry, which is the cloud. And it's a business model as much as it's a, it's a package of technologies, and it has an impact in how people think about things, whether they are putting their data some other place because it's cheaper in the near term for it, uh, or is uh, some kind of elastic engine. So panelists, um, Paul, maybe we start with you. You talked about cloud a little bit. How has that had an impact uh, in terms of how people are thinking about uh, designs, the analytical experience, um, you know, there's just the whole ecosystem of, of, of uh, what gaming companies are trying to accomplish in their mission. How does the cloud affect all that? You know, a lot of, a lot of gaming companies are looking at cloud resources because it's, it's first of all, it's difficult to find uh, kind of the, the ops teams to, to manage, just, just managing the infrastructure, right? So a lot of people sure. look, at, look to cloud for, for that kind of help. Um, you know, and I think the other 
the other uh, benefit of cloud-based solutions uh, uh, is the fact that there is a large user base out there. You know, if you look at you know Vertica's user base versus Redshift's user base, you're going to find probably a lot more people using Redshift. And whether it's big data or small data, there's a lot more you know, community around those kinds of technologies. Um, you know, I, I think that you know the, the a drawback to the cloud is maybe you don't get the quite the performance. You know, you don't get the you know, running, running a solution on bare metal yeah. uh, is typically more performant. I know that, that when I was at Crowdstar, for instance, uh, we ran Vertica on Amazon's cloud and uh, migrated off there onto bare metal and, and really system equivalent to system equivalent bare metal, we saw a 30% improvement uh, just in performance I'm, without making any changes. Yeah, I'm with you. And one of the things I have heard in a different vertical, and that is this idea of research. Um, and I want to get your take on the gaming side, because the idea of putting research or analytics for research in the cloud, it kind of presupposes that others can add to and take away um, uh, models or other components. And it makes the community experience of doing research, whether it's genomic research or trying to find root cause analysis or cancer research, uh, it improves it because it's an ecosystem play. Does that have an idea, I mean, is that, does it have merit in the world of gaming to do mashups between games and gaming ecosystems? Mm. Or, or am I just off on left field here? I don't know. I think, I think gaming companies, you know, if you're a gaming company with multiple titles, yeah. um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. You know, usually game, gaming that's companies like to stay. That's they bring like me in. Like they bring these hard questions. <laughs> gaming companies typically don't do mashups with each other. Yeah. Um, um, I know there were some ad networks uh, back in, you know, 2010, 2011. Uh, anyone familiar with Voltron, the ad network Voltron? It, that's, that's what it was trying to do, was trying to do cross-selling between uh, different titles, between different social games. Right. Uh, and the idea was, you know, you submitted, you know, you ran your ads in the Voltron network and, and it would share ads with like-minded games. Uh, you know, wh wh where, there, where there was some potential cross-selling between different studios games. Sure. Uh, but that's, that's as deep as I've seen that kind of mashup go. All right. Fair enough. Other thoughts from this collection of highly smart, math-oriented gaming-centric, audience-driven people? What are you thinking? What are your thoughts on the cloud? How many are actively using it in their mission? None. One. <laughs> you want, do you care to comment on your thoughts? Uh, I think it's great for yeah. Hold on. I think it's a great way to start out on a number of different things um, because it does push a lot of the um, to your point, the need to hire a, a team to manage uh, some of the things, and at some point, as costs escalate, you know, it might be something to transition away from. But I think there's definitely some benefits to it. So. Yeah, I think at, at scale, when 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 you start to talk about, uh, you know, I have a data warehouse of of you know 100 terabytes, and, and I'm moving a lot of data across the wire. Uh, that's when when the the benefits of the cloud starts to fall apart. Uh, or from a, from a cost perspective, right? Uh, that, that check you're writing monthly to Amazon gets quite large and, and there's, there's definite strategies to pull some of that, that uh, infrastructure back in-house, put it in a data center, hire a, some staff to, to manage it and actually save money. Um, yes, yeah, so. my, uh, my colleague Glenn likes to say, every startup begins in the cloud until they hire their CFO. Yeah. So, um, I was going to ask you, uh, and I would imagine me much of this community uh, uh, is or deals with analysts or data scientists who are just as well degreed analysts, I guess you would say. Uh, and I would like to know from a panelist perspective, um, as the uh, gaming industry evolves around data and analytics, how has their life changed? What new value are they pursuing? How are the tools maturing to kind of match their expectations? What's going on there? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that the, uh, the increase of the ETL tools and the ability to extract the unstructured data has become so much easier that the data scientists are able to focus their efforts on uh, more important problems or, you know, be able to take that data and, and really leverage it to improve the game or improve the monetization of the game uh, and spending a lot less time uh, in the, more in the details, more in the, the actual text extraction. Um, now that, you know, you can much easier, you know, bring in a, a text, you know, any, any sort of data, really. Um. So I would just like to add a couple of points. One is that I've been working with a lot of data scientists, and I've seen that majority of their time just go in data massaging, the, in doing data transformations. Yeah. They are very worried about, hey, I want, someone asked me a question from marketing team or sales team, uh, but I need this table. I need to load this table. I need to do this transformation. Uh, my query is taking just forever. Uh, they cannot deliver the answers fairly quickly. So what I think about data scientists is they are good with statistics. They can analyze the data. They can give us value, valuable insights about the data. But they need to get empowered with uh, the technologies uh, so that their life is easy. Uh, their 90% of the time should be spent on doing statistical analysis on top of sure. the data. But uh, when they are in the business of taking a sample of data and uh, uh, taking to their uh, local client machine and then analyzing it using, let's say, RStudio or some, some uh, MATLAB or any uh, technique that they use, and then sending the result back, that becomes tricky because now we are dealing with petabytes of data. Our clients have petabytes of data, and then, uh, I mean, even though their tables are partitioned, but if you see the size of the table, some tables go in like 33 terabytes of one table. So now when they are even getting a sample of data, uh, you cannot get the whole diverse picture. So that, that's a problem. So um, if we can empower data scientists with tools that they can run their statistical algorithm in parallel fashion, uh, let's say they want to do just logistic regression, and if they can distribute their task among multiple nodes, and they can leverage the power of that distributed, distributed computing framework, uh, that, that will be very helpful. So I'm seeing changes there. Uh, a lot of companies have already figured out that there is a problem and there is an opportunity to help the data scientists. Uh, but still, I have seen most of the data scientists struggling with the data engineering part. And that's, that's not their role. Uh, if we can dedicate, let's say, a couple of data engineers with a data scientist who can help them or who can take their R code and write a distributed version of that for them, uh, because uh, a data engineer might not be well versed with the statistical analysis. He might not know when to use k-means algorithm or when to use, let's say, Pearson coefficient uh, algorithm. So, uh, and most of few of those algorithms might not be even, we might not be able to uh, use distributed computing uh, for those algorithms. But it depends upon the data scientist who is trying to answer the, uh, who is trying to answer the question, hey, do I need the precise calculation? Or can I just uh, give, like say, if someone wants top 10 results, and they don't want the accurate, but they want just top 10. Uh, so we can write the algorithm in a fashion that won't give the accurate results, but with plus minus 5% or whatever is the error rate or uh, that, is, that is acceptable, uh, we can write the algorithm. Uh, there is a trade-off. It will run very fast. But it won't give exact, uh, the precision and scale will be different. So um, I think their database technologies have already figured it out, and there are tools. But still, a lot of improvement needs to be done there. I would like to see a lot of evolution happening there to help data scientists, because um, I think uh, uh, data scientists are asset to an organization, but if fully utilized. Paul? Yeah, I, I, I think we're, we're starting to see a little bit of, of evolution there, some, some, uh, some trends that are happening. You look at uh, you know, what, what Tableau did for data visualization, we're starting to see tools like Datamir, starting to see tools like uh, Alterix, uh, starting to see tools like uh, uh, Statistica sure. uh, that, that are simplifying the way that analysts deal with data, uh, really take away the complexity uh, and allow them to do, you know, more drag and drop type uh, functions to, to build uh, their analyses or their data integrations. Um, you know, I see that being, you know, I think that that trend is, is starting and I see that trend keep, you know, there's going to be more evolution in the mm. tools. 
But you know, if you look two years ago, when 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 you know the biggest complaint about Hadoop was there's there's no tools. Uh, now now the tools are coming, right? So it it's uh, uh, the yeah. Most of the developers were using or were spending most of their time in writing MapReduce programs, but uh, now uh, with the usage of uh, Yarn framework and with SQL capabilities on top of Hadoop, uh, analysts can go and run a query that is running against, uh, uh, let's say, massively parallel database. They can literally take that query and run it against, let's say, Impala. Uh, that will be giving uh, very high performance, and we are seeing a shift. Uh, in uh, teams where people are moving away from Hive and they're starting to use Impala just for the reason that uh, now data is sitting because it's a company's decision that, hey, we want a cheap resource where we can uh, store the data. But analysts are forced to now you know, learn new technologies. But with the advancement of SQL on Hadoop, especially with Impala, people can just write their SQL queries against uh, uh, the uh, files that are sitting on HDFS. You can convert the file in HDFS into parquet format and um, uh, create tables, partition tables, and you get very good performance, like sometimes even faster than the massively parallel database out uh, there. So it's, a, it's like a win-win situation because company wants to have a cheap storage solution. Uh, analyst wants to analyze the data. They want to run their queries against that data. So it serves both the purpose. And with the advent of Spark, um, basically you can literally take your uh, uh, you, you can take the same code that you have written for your um, uh, uh, analysis against the Hadoop HDFS file, you can convert into RDD files and you can start using the uh, Spark code. Uh, it supports Scala, beautiful language, small piece of code. Everyone can understand, I mean, who are in this uh, domain. And so we are seeing a shift that one massively parallel database um, columnar st like storage sure. uh, and then uh, in-memory distributed, in-memory computing, in-memory in uh, computing as well. So that, that's a, a good shift, I would say. And I want to piggyback off of the, the Datamere comment. Um, I was just using their tool last week, and they have a great visualization preview of your data set before you even have to run any queries. So I think that's really empowering analysts and empowering data scientists, so nice. that way they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to write any code to be able to see any spikes or to be able to visualize it. Um, and they can get that right up front, which is kind of changes the game and saves a lot of time. Excellent. Well, I want to do two things. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone in this room. Uh, I've heard of serious gamers, and I've, it seems like you are serious gamer analytic people because you're still here. And uh, secondly, I want to thank our panel, uh, the folks at Lilly and Sizer X, uh, for bringing expertise uh, from their industry uh, and I had know that I've learned uh, quite a bit, and I hope that you've taken something away, and I'm sure this team would love to hear from you. And those of you who kind of like to ask quiet questions, I'm sure they'll be around to take any of those. And so, again, my name is Anthony Dina. I'm from Dell. It's been a pleasure to spend time with you and enjoy the rest of this conference. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>